about what God has. Before we do that, I do have one, uh, two things we need to do. We need to dismiss U-turn, and uh, for all our uh, junior high students, you can head off with Pastor Jay. You're apparently not learning the perseverance lesson of listening to me again uh, today. Uh, and we also get to do a wonderful thing, which is announce the bands of marriage. Isn't that exciting? Again, another young couple getting married. This will be uh, Andrew Bowens and Amanda Simple. I believe Amanda's here somewhere. Yeah, there she is. And I think Andrew's gone today. Um, they're, we're announcing their bands. If you don't know what that means, basically, the, the government of Canada still allows the church to actually do Christian marriages. And so uh, they're being married by bands in a few weeks. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. Let's get uh, into God's Word today, and uh, it's been a little bit confusing, but it's actually going to tie in pretty well. We're going to skip the video, Carolyn, and uh, I didn't know this was, we'll, we'll catch the video next week. Uh, this series that we're going to begin today is, is all functioning around this word called if. I want you just to think about how often that word is used in your life and also in the Bible. It's constant in the Bible, often in a condition, if you do this, then this will happen. It's often connected with the promises of God, and we're going we're gonna to get to that. Uh, sometimes, we're gonna, in the next few weeks, we're going to talk a lot about um, if-only possibilities, these great possibilities of what God might do. But to get there, we have to get over the what-if regrets of our day and time. And that's kind of what we're going to start working on. I'm going to join in with Aunt Pastor Andrew and say, please, um, I want to encourage you really to go, you know what, I know I need to take another step spiritually. This is a great way to do it. Check uh, the, the kiosk out there afterward and say, you know, how can I get more involved in what's going on in Journey? Now, um, have you ever said to yourself, it's been like this so long, it's never going to change. Admit to me, you've got probably something in your life like that. It could be relationships, it could be habits, it could be a fear that you've always had. It could be unfulfilled goals and you've kind of given up on them, just never going to achieve that. Maybe it's an addiction that you wish you could break. Maybe it's just inaction in your life and somehow you can't find the motivation to do those things that you know you need to do. You want to do, but somehow not enough. I have been praying for us as a group and you, honestly, you individually, as many as you I can remember, that during the next few weeks that there's going to be a time of transformation for you and I and that we kind of move out of some of those deep regrets and move into great possibilities with God in our life. So we're going to just kind of begin to refocus uh, this morning. I want to pray for you, if that's okay. Um, that even right now, that God would begin to just kind of touch our hearts and begin to transform us even through the next 20 or 30 minutes. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning and uh, what you're going to do in this place today and that you are here with us, that you have chosen to meet with men and women and, and children. And God, that you're comfortable and you want to be here with us in this place and you want to bring healing and hope and life maybe conviction and you want to move us out of some things and move us into some things and and God we want to meet you here today so God help us God help us to really in the next 20 30 minutes to connect with you the way you want amen have you ever seen a sign um, that says this no regrets Anybody ever seen a sign like that? Got that sign up there? Carolyn, it's about to fist light in. I skipped a whole bunch to shorten it. No regrets. Anybody ever have that? Ever seen that? <laughs> How many of you think that's a smart thing? Actually, it's kind of interesting. One of the definitions of a psychopath is a person who experiences no remorse or regret at any of their actions. <laughs> Sociopaths are also defined by the same name or that same definition. So this whole idea that, hey, I'm going to live in no regrets. I don't really care what I did in the past or what happened to me in the past. <gasps> Somehow I'm going to shake all that off and I'm going to live without regret in my life. Don't do that. That's dangerous. It's not, a, it's not a healthy way to live. I think what we're hoping that statement is saying 
is that I hope that I am not controlled by my regrets. I'm not in a debilitated state because of living in regret on things that have happened in the past. I hope that's what's meant by it. Because the reality is we should have regrets as we go through life. There should be some things that we go, oh, I'd like a redo on that one. How many of you had a moment like that already this week? It's Sunday, all right? Like, oh, man, I wished I wouldn't have said that to the kids on the way to church because I know I'm going to need to pray, ask for forgiveness, right? There's lots of different degrees of regret, aren't there? There's inconsequential things. I forget to get the garbage out on Monday, so the house, the garage is going to smell a little bit more, and we'll take it out next Monday. Probably not that big a deal, right? However, there are regrets that go very deep within us, and today, today I want to force you, if I can, to to join me in a journey that I've already been on this week, kind of traveling down the road of regret, deep regret. (laughs) I don't want to go down that road. Well, we want to hope that if we go down the road, it's going to help us. I want you to, for a few moments, to begin just to kind of think and ask yourself, do I have some really deep regret? Things that are really bothering me, things that are really deep within that I just wished hadn't happened. Maybe your greatest regret. And today I'm, I'm actually hoping you will make kind of a mental list of your greatest regrets. I did this exercise myself and I actually went back in my mind to my earliest deep regret of mine that I owned And I don't even know the year, but I know I was in junior high age. And surprising to you, uh, I lived in Texas. That's where fateful comes from. I lived in Texas, and uh, I like to talk a lot. I know that would surprise you as well. And uh, we were at a camp, Christian camp, and uh, I was in the center of about 20 or 30 people telling jokes. I know that would surprise you probably as well. And uh, in the middle of doing this, I took a shot at a young girl, shy, insecure, and I made a joke at her. And I remember looking in her face and and feeling regret and going, oh, I want to take that back. And do you know what? There's no taking it back, is there? There was no way to recapture those words, and I would have given anything. Five seconds after they came out of my mouth, I'd have given anything I had to get them back. Even to this day, that memory plagues me. Not that I don't think I've overcome it, but I've learned to live in that. It was actually a very good thing for me, ultimately, long term. Be careful with your words. Sometimes uh, the regrets that we have are for things that we have actually done to people, like in that situation. There's a great illustration in the the Bible. I I want you to think for me, who's probably the the most sinful person in the Bible, right? Who's the worst one in the New Testament? Paul. All right, here we go. Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. This is going to throw you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 9, For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I, what does he say? Persecuted the church. Once you know, Paul's just kind of throwing it out there. Everybody knew about it. It didn't go unnoticed. He just kind of threw it out there. He's telling people what actually happened. Like, I persecuted the church. Do you know how many times Paul mentions this in Scripture? Five. Five times this sinful action that he committed not once but multiple times is mentioned it's mentioned in his very first writing the book of galatians so it was in his mind very early on when he wrote the book of galatians it's in this passage in first corinthians which is kind of in the middle of his life and it's also in the book of acts recorded twice where he tells the whole story of what he did it's recorded by luke which was really kind of paul's a protege 
working with Paul, and, and definitely Paul was making sure that that got in his work. See, this reality that, that Paul mentions what he went out and did, that men and women, both men and women, he hunted down. He took them captive. He signed the orders here, voted for their execution. I want you just to kind of let that hang on your mind for a moment. Had you done that, how would that plague you? How would you deal with that every day when you thought about it, when you heard a name of someone that you remembered that, yeah, it was their dad? I took his dad to prison and he was killed there. Now that's regret. That's painful, enormous regret by one of the greatest men spiritually that's ever lived. How about you? What's your greatest regret? I didn't share my greatest one. I shared a safe one. <laughs> I was a kid. You can kind of give me an excuse. It was kind of learning. And, but I want you to know and thank you for the 20 years and, of remembering the good stuff. Because there's, there's some regret even with some of you, some things if I could go back and say differently or do differently or maybe be there in a different way, I would do so. Once again, you don't get to do that, do you? Do you have regrets? Deep ones. I'm trying to give you some moments just to kind of let your mind go back and go, oh yeah. Sometimes regrets are not just things that we have done to others, but sometimes the regrets are things that we didn't do. Things that we didn't follow through with, opportunities that we didn't take. Sometimes it can be things for ourselves or things for others. And these can be just as painful. Matter of fact, in a study that was done of end-of-life patients, patients who were right at the end of life, they listed five things kind of consistently that were kind of their most painful regrets. Here they are. The fifth one, the, the, the number five on the list was they wish they would have been happier or allowed themselves to be happier. They couldn't understand why they had been so grumpy. The fourth one was all about relationships. Why didn't they invest more in relationship, particularly friends and family? Why did they allow bitterness to exclude them from people? The third one is they didn't express their feelings enough. They let things go. They didn't say the things that need to be said. The, the, the second one, and the one that was listed by every male that took the survey, got it? Why did I work so much and miss my family? Why did I do that? And the first one was unfulfilled dreams. They, things that they didn't do, and particularly how they wasted the opportunities of life. That they didn't take advantage of them. How about you? Where are you in a life of regret at this moment? You're thinking, why is he doing this to me? I don't want to think about it, but right now for a few moments, we need to pull those up to the front and we need to deal with them. Because these regrets can create guilt and shame and we operate out of those guilt feelings and those shameful feelings. Some of our guilt and some of our shame is justified. Sin has been behind these regrets. My first one, the one I shared with you, was sinful. It was a desire to look good at the expense of other people. It was also a waste of giftedness that I, I didn't know it at the time, but God had kind of gifted me to like to to speak and talk about truth and use language in a way to promote God, not destroy people. And I blew it. Both occasions, just sinful. Maybe some of your guilt is not that way. It's shame that's being reinforced by others on you. And you have felt shameful guilt feelings, and you're not even sure if you should or not. And today, I hope God helps you kind of sort those things out. Regret for hurting others, failing God, wasted time, wasted talent, wasted energy. Have any of these trickled into your mind? If they have, I hope you're ready now to move beyond and through those. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. 
I want you to read this verse with me, if you can. I'd like for you to say it out loud. Let's read it together. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Let's read it again. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This series of book uh, on if is going to come through the whole chapter 8 of Romans. Every week, there's going to be a passage of Scripture that you should hold on to and you should memorize. This is one of the most beautiful pieces of spiritual literature that's ever been written, this chapter 8 of the book of Romans. And there's wonderful passages to hold on to. This is one of them. You should know this one. You should memorize this one. You should speak this one to yourself all the time. Every time guilt comes up for something that has already been dealt with, you need to go, wait a minute, there's no condemnation for that. Let's explain what this means. The idea that there is no condemnation is this idea that there has been a judicial decision by God himself. God himself has looked down at what took place, not naively. He didn't look down and go, oh, wait, I didn't really see that. He didn't do that. But he looked down and by an act of his declaration, he has declared innocence. He has actually, to be honest with you, gone beyond that. He has created innocence. He didn't just say, oh, you know what, you're innocent. I know you're guilty, but you're innocent. He actually looked down and said, look, innocence. And he creates that in us. And where this judicial condemnation has not taken place, and matter of fact, innocence has been spoken by the God of this universe, then there should be so, no subjective condemnation. There should be no feeling of condemnation. This is not just for anyone. Because that's kind of where we are in the world today. Listen to me. Here's what the world is doing. Don't put anything on the wrong list. Then you won't feel guilty for anything. Do you understand what I'm saying? Lower the moral standards where there is nothing wrong Anything goes, and then you won't feel guilt. Guess what? It doesn't work. What we actually need to do is just the opposite. We need to raise the standard up and go, this is the standard of where guilt and condemnation should come in. How do I deal with that? So it's not just for anyone just to say, oh, I have no regrets. But the Bible says this condemnation is this no condemnation de declaration is given for those who are in Jesus Christ or in Christ Jesus. It's really clear. It's for those who accept his sacrifice for sin. And I want to kind of get this beyond this moment where I go, oh, okay, I'll grab a hold of that. That sounds like fun. I'll just kind of add that to everything else going on in my life. That's not what the Bible's talking about. It's talking about being in Christ Jesus. Jesus. It's being connected with him. It is being absolutely forged in life with his life. That's where the life of no condemnation, both judicially and subjectively, will be found. And if you're saying, well, I, I think I've done that, but I have all these guilty feelings, I would encourage you that maybe you need to deal with this connectedness to the person of Jesus. Not kind of a random thing, but a continual thing. Verse 2 of this same chapter says this. This is the way it explains this. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life, this idea of this connected life with Jesus, what is meant there? For this connected life with Jesus has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. From this kind of standard that always points the finger and always says you're wrong, always says you're guilty. That connected life with Jesus is what frees me from the bondage of that guilt. It sets us free from the law of sin, which brings about our guilt, our shame, and our, and our, our regret. It's not that we did not do it. It's not that. It's that God has truly forgiven us. I want you to think of that worst regret you have right now. The one that if, if you had to say it out loud, you would just die. I want you to understand that is the regret that Christ wants to work on with you today. 
If you have two or three, you're sitting going, I can't decide. They're all horrible. That's the one that Christ is looking at with you today, saying, you know what? I want to take that one away. He goes on in, in verse 3 and 4. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. I want to kind of put it in today's context of this sermon, what this, kind of, what this verse actually means. I want you to think about it right now. The only person ever that could actually walk around and go, you know what, no regrets, I got none, is actually Jesus. He did not sin, so he had nothing to fuel this, this sense of guilt or shame or regret on any of his decisions. But not only that, on the flip side, on the other side, he did everything that he was asked to do or called to do by God his Father. There was nothing that he did not complete and not, did not do completely. So Jesus walked around as this guy with no regret, at least personally for himself. He often saw and regretted what was going on in the world around him. The Bible talks about he had compassion on people. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he saw things and he was moved that way with how the world was. But personally, with his own decisions, there was no regret. And you know what he does in the cross? He actually takes our regrets and he gives us his no regret life. That's what this being connected with him intimately means for you and I. That he gives us this life of victory over regret. Well, how do we you know, get to this no condemnation moment? Because if you're like me, I still struggle from time to time. It comes back, it's fresh, it's kind of new still. God, how do I do that? Is that by ignoring, as the world would say, just ignore my failures? And the answer is no, it's about repentance of these deep regrets. Normally in our lives, this is what repentance sounds like. Oh God, forgive me if I did something wrong. Or just forgive me of all my sin. That's, that's not bad. <laughs> but today I want to take you in a different place. I want you to ask yourself the question, could God forgive my deepest regrets that are really fueled by sin? A waste of time, a waste of my talent, a waste of my energy, the way I treated some of my relationships, what I said on that moment, what I did against my spouse, what I did to my children, what I have done to my own body. Could God forgive me for my greatest regret? And the good news today is absolutely. And he wants you to pray specifically today about that regret. Not generally about every sin that you've ever done, but specifically about those. I want to encourage you today to begin to think, God, I'm going to do it today. I'm going to let go of my greatest regret. If you have not condemned me, then I will no longer condemn myself or take on the condemnation of others for those things which you have forgiven. Wouldn't you just like to be free of it? That great failure in your life? that you're so embarrassed about. This is not the end of the story, though. God is not finished with us just whenever we find forgiveness for the past because God likes to do something with that. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I want to read this second part of this passage about Paul. The guy that wrote the book of Romans, he had this, that he, when he said, I, for I'm the least of the apostles, I'm worthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God, but... Oh, this is a good one. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, speaking of the other apostles. Though it was not I, but the grace of God that is in me. I want you to think about this for a moment. Normally, our greatest regrets, our shame, our, re our, our, our guilt, actually debilitates us from movement. We wallow in it. It makes us think, you know what, I just can't do that. I'm not going to do that again. I failed last time. I'm not going to try it again. I blew it. I'm, I blew it in relationships. I'm not going to do it again. 
And that's not what Paul does. This is where the grace of God took him. Instead of disqualifying him for future things, God actually brought good out of it. Paul became a vessel that was more open to God's grace than all the others. Why? Because God had forgiven him of so much. And it was God's grace that allowed Paul to live beyond guilt and then lead the church spiritually. I want you to kind of wrestle around with that, that God wants to do the same for you. God wants to provide a grace to live beyond whatever your greatest regret is. If it's relationships, He wants to help you be extremely loving in the ones you have now. I have one last kind of thought that has helped me going back to the, the failure I had that I shared with you this morning. I've had a lot more. That was just a safe one that I could share out loud. It has brought me some relief from pain because this I know for certain. God loves that young, scared girl that I nailed to the cross that day by my comments. He loves her a lot more than I do. I have prayed often, God Please help her wherever she is. Please make up for my failure with her. I want you to know what brings me a lot of peace. I've had to pray that more than once, uh, not just for her, but for others. I've got, God, I blew it on that moment. Please help them by somebody else because I messed it up. And maybe that's where you're going to be today because the regret is so deep and you just can't get a hold of God. What can I do? You can trust Him. You can trust Him to go in where you can't go, to speak to someone you can't speak to, to try to heal a wound that you cannot heal, and ask Him to do that for you. Today, I want to ask you just a real quick question. The worship team is going to come. Would you like forgiveness for your greatest regret? Would you like forgiveness for the ones particularly that are fueled by sin? Sinful action, sinful thoughts. Would you like that today? I would like for you, if you want to be there, if you want to enjoy that today, even if it's just getting over the guilt of it, it's been so long ago, but you've lived with the guilt, that today is the day for you. We're going to experience communion today, which is a representation of, of God's sacrifice in the person of Jesus for you. It's a thing we do to remember that sacrifice for sin. Today is not just about any sin, but about those deepest regrets. Today, as you come and as you partake of communion, I want it to be about God. Please help that person I wounded. Only you can do that. God, please help me to live beyond my greatest failures. Let me experience that grace to do great things for you if that's where you are. Or if you're in that spot where you're going, God, I'm still being controlled by my regrets. Please forgive me. If that's where you are, please experience God's grace as we commune with him this week. I'd like to pray for us. And the worship team is going to lead this song and you can come partake of communion as we're, we're singing. I'd imagine most of us in this room, if we really think about it, have something we go back and go, man, I blew it. And I've really never dealt with it. I've just kind of shoved it away. And, and now I just say, if only. If only I could get that back. If only I could. If only today there is a, a solution it's the wonderful sacrifice of Jesus Christ for you so Father thank you that we can live beyond the regrets Paul is a great example for us in the scripture God of how he did it and God we want to experience that today that you have this ability to take our deepest most horrible regrets. We have blown it. We have hurt others. We have hurt ourselves. 
We have wasted what you have given us. And you can turn something good out of that. Only you can do this, Lord. So God, we pray that today you would give us your no regret life because of this victory that you're going to perform in us. As we first and foremost experience deep forgiveness for these quiet areas. Today, just in case you're a guest with us here at Journey, our communion is open to anyone who wants to grow closer to Jesus Christ. If you confess Him, or you want to confess Him, this is a great way to begin and uh, connect with Him. Feel, please feel free to come, receive the communion, take it at your leisure, and whenever it's comfortable for you, and pray. God help.